Well, good morning. Good to be with you again. Before we get going, I wanted to share some unhappy news I got, but don't take me too seriously. I just learned that Harry's place in Colchester has been shut down. I was planning on going there on Monday for lobster bisque, but not enough social distancing, and so we're going to have to wait for a while, but it is something to look forward to. We have now reached the Thursday of Holy Week, and I've got to admit I am overwhelmed. As I've read the text regarding Thursday, so much happened on that day that it would be easy for me to spend months working through all of the relevant subjects that have come up. The Gospel of John alone devotes five full chapters to this day, beginning with the preparations for what would be the Last Supper going up until the arrest of Jesus. But today, we have about 15 minutes, so hang on. Traditionally, today is called Maundy Thursday. That word Maundy comes from the Latin word that means mandate or commandment. The command that this refers to is recorded in John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. Jesus said, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The Greek word translated love here is agape. And this word isn't a romantic love or a friendship love. It's best defined as a love that is a commitment to another for their good. It is essentially a selfless, not selfish, selfless love. As Jesus said, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now that leads to the question, how did Jesus love us? Well, let's read John 13 together, verses 1 through 17. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. Other versions will read, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around them. Now, the next number of verses center on Jesus' drama with Peter, who didn't want his feet washed but his whole body, but we'll skip that and jump to verse 12. When Jesus had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you, he asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example so that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master. That word servant is the Greek word denoting slave. Foot washing is a slave's duty. It's the lowliest household duty. And Jesus was willing. For Jesus and for us, to serve as slaves requires a confidence of identity. Jesus knew both who 
and whose he was. Confidence of identity must precede humility of service. Jesus, verses 3 and 4, knew that the Father had put all things under his power. He knew that he had come from God. He knew he was returning to God. And so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Knowing who we are and whose we are, and knowing our eternal destiny gives us the freedom to serve, gives us the freedom to walk in humility, gives us the freedom to take up the towel and basin and wash feet. Now, I'm not talking literally, although who knows, God may put us in a place where that happens. My eldest daughter on a missions trip to Malawi ended up washing the feet of villagers who were plagued with mites and they were medically treating feet. She washed the feet of a whole lot of people. But listen, we gain our freedom to serve whether it's the washing of feet or engaging of other acts of love by knowing who we are. And we are children of God. We are daughters and sons of the Most High God and our home is in heaven. That changes our perspective and gives us great freedom to step out and serve the Lord and through serving the Lord, serve others. When Jesus had finished washing his disciples' feet, he said in verses 15 to 17, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. Jesus here gives us a classic if then promise. If you do this, then you will receive this. Jesus said, if you follow my example, then you will be blessed. The Apostle Paul writes of Jesus' example. He takes it up in Philippians chapter 2. Starting in verse 4, Paul writes this, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, God come in the flesh, made himself nothing, and took on the very nature of a servant. Further, he humbled himself, humbled himself to the point of going to the cross and dying for you and for me, dying in our place that we might have life. This is the greatest example of love that is a commitment to another for their good. Imagine the difference it would make in all of our relationships, in all of our dealings with other people, if we wrapped our head, but more importantly, our heart around that definition of love. What a difference it would make at home, with our spouse, with our loved ones. Love that is a commitment to another for their good. In both John and Philippians, we are called to follow Jesus' example of love. 
Now, all of that was before supper. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. He talked about love. He talked about service while the dinner was being prepared. As they began to eat, as they sat around that table, Jesus announced, and this is no way to start a celebration, he announced that one of them, the disciples, was about to betray him. I think what happens next reveals a little bit of insecurity on the part of these disciples because each of the disciples wondered if he meant them. Judas is then sent out to do what he had decided to do, and all was now set in motion. During this Passover meal, which had taken a very somber tone, during this Last Supper, Jesus took the bread and the cup and redefined them. In Luke chapter 22, verses 19 and 20, we read, He took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. For the disciples that night who were there, and for all followers of Jesus all time since then, this meal no longer points us, as Passover was meant to do, to Israel's deliverance from Egypt. Instead, it now points to our deliverance from sin and death through faith in the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, Jesus. Whereas Israel had to sacrifice a lamb over and over and over again every year, Jesus was sacrificed once for all. He died on the cross, bearing our sin, paying the price our sin demands, which is death. This would be made horribly and wonderfully clear tomorrow, a day that is now called Good Friday, when Jesus out of his love, his selfless love, his love for you and for me, shed his blood and died on the cross that we might live. Amen, and God bless you.